now, that is this year. My Lords, I rise to speak to amendments 224 and 230 standing in my name. Um, before I do so, I'd like to make a supportive remark um, about um, Amendment 226 in the name of my noble friend, Lord Lilly. Uh, but could I just remind committee, since it's such a very long time, <coughs> excuse me, since it's such a very long time since we had second reading of this bill back in July, that the context in which it was introduced was one of a very serious energy crisis. Um, the, whether we have a climate crisis or not is highly debatable, and many of us don't accept that alarmist language. But that we undoubtedly had an energy crisis in the course of last year um, is absolutely manifest in the lives of thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of ordinary people living in this country. And although we've been assisted by the weather in having a very moderate um, winter, and therefore less demand for um, domestic energy, uh, nonetheless, uh, that crisis, that energy crisis, has not abated, and prices remain extremely high, and energy is in short supply. We all know the reprehensible reasons lying behind that, and we condemn uh, Russia's action in Ukraine. But nonetheless, there is no likelihood of it ending very soon, as far as anyone can see. And we have a very serious crisis. That is the background to these amendments, and it is remarkable that one can hear a series of other, the amendments I'm speaking to. It is remarkable that in the same group we have a number of other amendments that are seeking to cut off radically, permanently and by statute forever um, access to energy supplies that we have available to us. Uh, the noble Baroness Lady Sheehan was somewhat surprised that I should talk, and I will come to in more detail to Amendment 224 in a moment, that I should talk about um, increasing gas supply in order to reduce foreign dependency in Amendment 224. Uh, the noble Baroness seems to think that we have a target of zero carbon emissions um, set in law in this country. We do not. We have a net zero target, and there is nothing that I am aware of in government policy that says that uh, the use of some uh, amounts of carbon, including gas, uh, in our energy mix um, over the long term is not going to be is not both foreseeable and acceptable provided it meets a net zero target and the question at the heart of amendment 224 which i was hoping to probe the government on is whether they have a strategy for um, for reducing our very heavy dependency on foreign supplies of gas in particular and, and what they intend to do about it. And although it does contain the word increase, which I see now, I, I rather regret as being a slightly infelicitous, the effect of the amendment would apply even if we were reducing our gas consumption in this country, because the purpose of it is to ensure that whatever the gas supply, even if it be quite minimal, 75% of it, be, and the numbers are slightly arbitrarily drawn, I admit, it's a probing amendment, 75% of it should be sourced domestically in order to give us that degree of resilience which, we so, which is so important to us and which, if I may say so, the noble Baroness Lady Worthington spoke about so eloquently earlier in committee this afternoon in relation to storage. But, of course, storage is valuable only if you have some production, something you've produced to put into store in the first place. So, to some extent, my amendment is tying up with what the noble Baroness said earlier. Um, concerning the um, amendment, in, before I come to amendment number 230, concerning amendment 226 in the name of my noble friend, Lord Lilly, again, I think it astonishing that we should want... Um, to um, cut off uh, access to uh, what could be an important source of energy in this country, one which the, the fruits of which we have been importing in huge amounts from the United States uh, without any qualms whatsoever, it appears, because so much of that LNG that's coming here from the United States is in fact the result, I believe, of fracking in that country. But here we should be happy to consume it hypocritically at the same time, saying that we can't possibly allow it in Britain, as if the modest amount, and I agree with, to a certain extent 
with the noble Lord, Lord Tevison. The, relative, the relatively modest amount, certainly modest in comparison with the United States, that we might be producing here was somehow globally unacceptable in climate terms while consuming the products, uh, the product of the United States um, is, is, uh, is fine, and we can carry on doing that and turn our noses to one side. <coughs> No, I thank the, the noble Lord Lordman. I, just to say, I, I am not objecting to uh, importing. That's nothing to do with uh, in terms of how fracking. In fact, I've supported fracking in the past. The point is, the time has gone. It's all changed, and uh, the United States has been fracking for some time. If we uh, import that, I have no problem uh, with that. What my whole concern is about new sources, new exploration. Well, I'm grateful for that clarification. If the noble Lord is saying that the time has gone, that is, it seems to me, essentially a commercial and practical judgment. It may be right. I do not run a fracking company. I know very little in practice about fracking. It is possible that the time has gone in commercial terms. It's possible it might not be a sensible uh, thing to do in current circumstances. None of that is grounds for ruling it out as a matter of statute and prohibiting it. Um, it's, completely, uh, it's complete nonsense to suggest uh, doing that. But even, even uh, if my noble, uh, if um, 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 so, anyway, we will leave fracking for the moment to one side. If I could turn, to, therefore, to Amendment 230, this is a, a much narrower and more technical probing amendment, uh, which relates to the composition of the domestic gas supply. Uh, and it uh, takes me back to my boyhood, really, and the boyhood of a number, and girlhood, of the childhood, perhaps I should say, of the number of people in this room who might remember what life was like, uh, not everybody, I have to say, uh, what life was like before we had North Sea gas pumped into our homes, when we had town gas, which was the product of, which was produced from coal. And the content of town gas was a mixture of gases. Uh, including uh, CH4, CO, CO2, H2, higher order hydrocarbons and phenols, and the composition was adjusted according to the calorific value. And when we switched over to North Sea gas, the composition of the gas that we used um, became overwhelmingly methane, with a small amount of higher order hydrocarbons. The switchover using methane allowed the calorific value to be higher. And those of us with very long memories will recall that it was marketed as high speed gas, which meant hot. You know, it had a high calorific value, so you could cook all that much faster. Moreover, we then put that composition into legislation. And it is the, the legislation, I'm grateful to the House Library for this, uh, for finding this for me. The legislation is that referred to in my Amendment 230, which is the Gas Safety Management Regulations of 1996. Now, the result of that is that today a significant amount of gas that we, ex that we could extract from the North Sea is not being extracted because it cannot be used in our domestic supply by law. A lot is going to waste, in effect. And the proposal here, and again it's a probing amendment, is to ask the government if they would reflect on this and consider whether, given the energy crisis that we have been facing, it might not be sensible and possible to amend those regulations so that we could actually make use of many of these gases which are currently going to waste but could nonetheless be fed into our domestic system. It would mean potentially the calorific value would be a little bit lower in our cookers. So it might take you that little bit longer uh, to, to, to bake your cake and, and um, there are a number of television programs that might be affected by this in detail. The outcomes might, might change. But nonetheless, in terms of efficiency at a time when we are desperately in need of energy, it is certainly something worth looking at. But my... Yes? I'm very grateful. I'm listening to you with some interest. But those of us with long memories do remember the dangers inherent in the gas that was used before 
um, the date that he was talking about, and the number of suicides that took place. Do you think that there is a health and safety issue here before we start going back to those days and that sort of gas? <coughs> My Lords, it is indeed, as it says in the, uh, the, the, the name of the regulations which I'm suggesting be reviewed, do indeed say the gas safety management regulations. So I fully acknowledge the noble Baroness's point that this is a question of safety. But it isn't necessarily the case that these regulations passed in 1996, which we're still adhering to, couldn't be looked at to see if precisely as I say uh, in, my, um, um, in my amendment, whether they could be safely amended to allow the more efficient use of extracted gas. It may be that they can't, but I think it is a point that some 20 years on, it, it would be more than 20 years on, nearly 30 years on almost, it would be helpful if the government could look more closely at. But my principal point in raising these amendments does in fact relate to Amendment 224. A little bit like the noble Baroness Lady Worthington earlier, I want to know whether the government has a strategy for resilience, whether dependence on foreign supplies is something it contemplates going on endlessly um, in very large measure, uh, and what they would like uh, in fact to do about it. Because an awful lot of people I think in this country were shocked to discover the level of dependency we had on imports and would like to hear that we were becoming more self-sufficient. Uh, the noble lord sits down. Um, I wonder if I can just address some of the comments that he made in response to, to my comments earlier. Um, I th it's very, very clear to me that we have a fundamental um, difference of opinion when it comes to the science behind climate change. I believe climate change is real and I believe the change uh, that we're experiencing. I'm afraid that the noble lady can't speak twice in this section. Well, I've just been advised. Sorry, committees. Probably, yeah. Sorry. I think I've received the incorrect <laughs> advice, so I apologise. <laughs> the... Um, so I, I would ask the noble lord whether, what evidence he can point to that climate change isn't real because there is substantial evidence from, ranging from the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that is at unprecedented levels, which is verified by um, ice core samples from the Antarctic, tree rings um, over, a century, uh, over millennia. Um, and that correlates... And the changes in carbon dioxide correlate precisely to changes in climate um, that we've seen uh, in historic times. Um, so that is the basis on which my amendments have been tabled. And uh, they are very clearly um, designed to meet the legal duties of the government under the Climate Change Act. And, um, and its need to reduce oil and gas consumption to meet net zero by 2050. The Noble Lord's Amendment talks about a strategy for increasing domestic gas production. I, I wonder, that cannot be compatible with meeting climate change targets. The government has a legal duty to do that. Will the Noble Lord, uh, Noble Lord, uh, Lord Moylan, please accept that? May I? Uh, I'm grateful for those points. I, I try to answer briefly since they've put me directly. First of all, uh, nothing in what I said, I hope, suggested, uh, implied or stated that I uh, did not accept that climate change was happening. I'm also perfectly happy to uh, accept uh, that there is a man-made contribution to that. Uh, what I rejected is the language of climate alarmism and the language of climate crisis, because the question, what is the consequence in practice of a change uh, a, a, of climate change, and what are the best means for dealing with it, remain absolutely open. We have seen uh, over the last 20 years wild and extravagant and unjustified claims about how large parts of the world are going to sink under water and we're all going to scorch and, and whatever. Whereas what in fact we see is very little of that, but we see a few weather events being played up as if they're great catastrophes. Even if they were happening, the question arises, what do you do about it? 
And there are many of us who would rather put emphasis on mitigation and adaptation rather than what we're doing at the moment, which is absolutely damaging our economy. We are damaging our economy um, in order that we should try to avoid those emissions. Now, there are those who would say that that damaged the economy, the cost, which has been estimated as at least 1% of GDP per annum by the Climate Change Committee, but which most people probably, I think, fairly recognise would be closer to 4 or 5%. There are people who say that that cost is both necessary and justified. But it is a damage, nonetheless, to our economy, and not all of us accept that it is necessary and justified and that there are other methods of dealing with it. So I have not rejected climate change, and I, hope the no and I do, of course, accept that net zero is a statutory target. I, did, I said nothing contrary to that. Uh, and I, do, I did, if I may repeat this slightly, and I, this is my fault entirely, it's the problem of having amateurs drafting amendments. I'm an amateur. Um, I, I did apologise when I spoke for using the word increase because that wasn't, and I can, I can change that if it came back on report, because that wasn't quite what I meant. I meant increase relative to imports such that I did explain my amendment would be applicable even if our consumption of gas was falling. So I don't think there's that much in the uh, substance in the comments that Lady Sheehan has made, the noble baroness has made about my uh, remarks, but we do nonetheless have a profound disagreement, less about the science and more about what to do about it. Uh, my lords, um, uh, 